OK, like we were saying, it was more than a book. So Temporary Services uh, struck up this pen pal relationship with this inmate named Angelo, who was incarcerated on the West Coast. We got very few details as audience members about what Angelo had done. And Temporary Services was really specific about not asking. So they were never interested in talking to him about his crimes, although one could assume that there was something pretty serious because he was there for quite some time. He actually died in the last couple of years, so he did manage to get released from jail and uh, live on his own for a couple of years, and temporary services you know, kept in touch with him throughout. So as far as I understand, this is a multi-decade relationship that they built with Angelo. Uh, so Prisoner's Inventions, you can see a lot of these online, uh, but one thing that made Angelo so uh, interesting was that he was a fantastic draftsperson. So he would write uh, letters out, and I believe these letters were technically against the rules. So he would be making these diagrams of uh, tattoo guns, you know, things that we sort of come to expect from prisoners inventions from television, but also a lot of stuff that was really human and just about comfort and a sense of home. So you can see he was very specific. And um, I believe what he said was that he wasn't allowed to make the drawings because then he would be educating inmates on how to make the things, but he was learning how to make the drawings from the inmates who were making the things. So there was a sort of absurdity involved because he was documenting what was already happening, uh, but the prison styled it as something that could happen. But it was, you know, the horse was already out of the barn. Now, in addition to some of the things you might expect, some of them were this weird combination of very small, so just the ability to make your own hot water on demand, and also very dangerous. So in this case, uh, there are these little metal pieces traveling along the side of a bunch of toothbrushes that have been melted together with a lighter. Or actually, lighters are probably not. Uh, not allowed, so that was a whole other thing, you know, getting access to, uh, to an open flame. But then you would take the metal tabs that you would use to bind uh, legal documents into an old-style binder, and those are actually plugged right into a, um, a, a wall outlet, and then you would submerge this thing in water, and the, the mains electricity would be in there blasting the water just to get it hot. So something really dangerous in order just to get, you know, this basic sense of comfort like some uh, warm tea or a drink. So the other really uh, beautiful thing that Temporary Services did with Angelo was they got him to make a full-on plan for his jail cell. And again, this was something else he wasn't supposed to be doing. And then they had fabricators with Mass Mocha, that fantastic art space uh, up in the Northeast. Uh, they worked with, um, uh, I'm dropping the curator's name, Nato Thompson. And they had this entire jail cell fabricated to Angelo's specs so that visitors to the show could walk inside of the jail cell and figure out a little bit what it actually felt like to be in there to lend some context to, um, to the objects that they were seeing. So Temporary Services worked with some little grad students like me and others to recreate a bunch of the inventions that Angelo wrote about on the outside. And then all of those inventions and the, um, and the paperwork that described them was all displayed in uh, sort of museum fashion at Mass Mocha. And uh, I, I believe this exhibit traveled around a lot too. But it was really, really inspiring uh, as a young person just to be slightly involved with it. I was the one who worked on um, a sex toy called a Fifi. And I'll let you guys uh, Google that uh, <laughs> in terms of how that, how that operates. It was uh, too easily puncturable, so that one did not actually make it through the mail uh, to Mass Mocha. So I'll, I'll leave that to your, your uh, Googling proclivities. Uh, so if you took a look at this really nice piece that was written uh, after Angelo's death on prisonphotography.org, there were this couple of ideas that really brought home for me why temporary services was so interesting um, and that show up a lot in my art practice too. Uh, one was that objects were never really the goal. So the actual things were kind of immaterial. I mean, they were useful to show people uh, a part of the reality inside of prison, but really this thing was all about relationships talking with Angelo, identifying his humanity. And he was sort of a conduit that taught us about other people in prison because he was writing about a prison culture, not just himself. And I, I found that really inspiring. So another thing I found really inspiring that was sort of temporary services was rolling around in my mind. And then years later, I was also starting to think about other experiences of prison. So there was this incredible group of prisoners who sued the government, the Department of Justice, um, I believe in 99, 2001, somewhere around there, saying that they were being subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. So their constitutional rights were being violated because Tams prison in particular, which is now since closed, and many artists have made work about Tams as well, but it's a Southern Illinois, uh, former Southern Illinois prison. 
uh, Tams was meeting out this type of punishment where they would make a prison loaf for a neutral loaf. So they had sort of scientifically organized the ingredients for this thing. They were all off the shelf ingredients, so potato flakes, um, tomato paste, uh, garlic, uh, garlic powder, things like that. And they would bake it into this completely tasteless brick. And so if you had committed particular types of infractions, like stabbing somebody with a utensil or throwing an apple or something like that, and these are all specific examples from the court case, then you might be put on controlled feeding status where you just get this for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner and no additional um, uh, utensils or anything else. You just kind of had to eat it with your hand like an animal. So they tried to argue it was violating their, uh, their rights according to the Constitution. And they lost that case, but it came down to this really interesting idea about being denied minimal civilized measures. And so, you know, having that in there, like, what is a minimal civilized measure, right? You think about Angelo documenting people that are willing to be electric, you know, risk electrocution and death just to get some, um, some hot tea. Uh, the tea itself may be made of like a strip of bologna or something, right? So it's just like the lengths people are willing to go to to find a, 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 minimi, a minimal civilized state, I thought was really uh, interesting. And then ultimately they lose because uh, we, don't, we aren't required to um, feed people tasty or aesthetically pleasing objects in jail. But you know, I mean, are you just trying to warehouse people or make them better or you know, inspire them to cause other problems? So I was also thinking about the sort of absurdity of all these things, the absurdity of some of the inventions that Angelo talked about and it wasn't necessarily absurd that the prisoners were doing these things. I think they were having a very realistic reaction to what you would do uh, given that amount of deprivation. But I was thinking about just the absurdity of the prison system. And then sort of by extension, because of this case, the absurdity of the food system in the United States. So on the one hand, we you know, force people uh, into these prisons and then say that you know, they have what they need even if they're eating totally disgusting food. Uh, the same thing happens with poor people out in society with food deserts or with people saying that you can't use food stamps to buy you know alcohol or other particular kinds of enjoyable substances tobacco and so forth and then on the other hand you have people that are so rich and have access to so much food that that's the problem right so there's too much amazing food to eat and then you have um, diseases that come from that like uh, like obesity and so forth so the, the whole thing struck me as really absurd very serious but a, as is usually my way I was trying to come to it with a sort of uh, I, I wanted to make an object that really uh, brought the absurdity to the fore so a number of years ago I worked on the prototype for this piece controlled feeding status uh, and then it was in a show at our glass curtain gallery uh, this uh, this Rube Goldberg theme show and so I was working in this 3D modeling program, Rhino, and the idea was I would take the, you know, the basic fork and the basic spoon with no frills, but then try to make a set for somebody that, that has the problem of access to too much food. So maybe you would, you would choose on a particular day to take in the spoon that has a larger mesh size than the peas that you're eating so that, you know, try as you might, you won't be able to take in as many calories uh, as, as you'd hope to. Uh, but these were ultimately fabricated in plastic. So I had this little glass vitrine to keep things precious and so forth, but ultimately uh, they didn't have the sort of the, the solidity or the, the aura that you look for uh, with a really sort of highly crafted object. So that was kind of step one. And what the, uh, the faculty to, uh, development grant allowed me to do was to, uh, to, to go beyond this prototype idea and to really make it uh, a lot more solid and, and to kind of rework it in the process. So, so here's a, a close up view of what these spoons looked like with their little stainless steel uh, nuts and so forth. So some other things that were inspiring me in terms of craft, I was trying to think about sort of what makes the eating process fancy. I mean, silverware as in sterling silver was certainly a part of it. I was also thinking a lot about um, the sort of like flatware rolls that you get, right? So you stick all of your utensils inside and roll them up to keep them from tarnishing or whatever. And that preciousness um, could also be found in the gun case. And that was sort of another crossover with criminal justice and, and you know, violence done to people and so forth, and, and having a case that would celebrate your ownership of a gun, which of course, kind of no matter when you work on that idea, that's a right now idea in the United States. Uh, so it got me thinking about walnut and sort of glass cases uh, with little fancy brass locks and these sort of fussy, like these weirdly fussy aestheticized elements that were coming with this killing device it was also really absurd. 
Uh, so what I wound up crafting was this walnut box. And um, I'll, I'll bring the, these objects down to the reception so everyone can take a look. But you know, I spent a lot of time. Um, you know, I, I went and got my own walnut plank and planed it down and, and crafted this box, and then ordered these very specific fussy uh, brass hinges from this super specific company and everything, trying to really get that look of something that's ultra fancy. And then when you open it, this is the the, the result inside. So what I wound up doing was sticking to forks, and when I recrafted this object. Uh, for output into sterling silver. And so I'll dip into the technology thing very briefly. Some people are interested in some art. Uh, but I was working with this company, Shapeways. So you've probably all seen 3D printing with plastic, where there's a nozzle that extrudes a thin line of material until you build something up based on a digital model. Uh, but with Shapeways, which is an online reseller of these different techniques, you could get a wax printed. So I worked in Rhinoceros, I crafted these forks, and then I used another program, Grasshopper, to sort of organically grow, almost literally grow, these warty structures on the forks. So if anyone has questions about that, I'm happy to talk more about it. Uh, but I should probably move right along. So, so each fork is progressively more uh, sort of infected or um, parasitized than the last. And then these objects went off to Shapeways. They were printed in wax. Shapeways also handled the traditional process of the wax being evacuated from a mold and replaced with sterling silver. And then when they came back, uh, technical limitations prevented them from being printed whole. So I worked with Megan Sotilli, who works in our 10th floor fabrication shop, and she helped me resolve these as pieces that really look uh, you know, jewelry-like or, or precious in nature. Uh, I also worked with Columbia's own Megan Sterling to get this brass etched plate that gives us the official recipe for neutral loaf. So if you go online, um, I can provide the link to this uh, if anybody wants it. But you can still see the whole court case and its results just laid out online. There's a recipe for a single meal loaf. This is the meat eaters version. There's also a vegetarian version because they're not monsters, I guess. Uh, so I made this today. Uh, I, I quadrupled the recipe. And due to a math error and my unwillingness to buy 3,000 pounds of dry milk powder for two ounces, you guys aren't going to get the milk powder, but it is going to be double beefy because I accidentally put the whole pound in. So it, 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 it's actually going to be a little bit better uh, than it is potentially, potentially in prison. So you know, it, it was interesting working on this object, um, particularly in light of the grant, because I felt like I could really start to use the materials that had to be there. And it's, it's interesting as a sculptor working in an age when anything can be 3D printed, but maybe not every single material is available yet. The satisfaction you get from the thing, it has the right form, you know, the size and proportion and so forth. But sometimes it really needs to be that certain metal uh, for, the, uh, for the object to hit home. So uh, here's just another little animation, an example of the sort of the growth of those warts. In a detail. So to finish it up, here's a, an example of a neutral loaf that I, I um, baked for a different show, actually the one at the glass curtain. I did my best to make sure that all of the spices were as bland as possible and managed to find uh, beans that were literally um, in plain sauce. I'd never encountered that before. But it seemed in keeping. Um, Sheriff Arpaio, right, who we've all seen on the news, seemed to be one of the big proponents of this kind of move. And he, um, it's interesting, if you, if you Google Sheriff Arpaio on YouTube, the title of this very popular video says, Sheriff Arpaio gags on Nutriloaf. Well, he doesn't, because it really does not taste that bad. And so it, it raises a sort of interesting question about, as my colleague owner, uh, when I bring the Nutriloaf down, you'll see there's a tiny nibble taken out of it. So I got an art historian to give it a shot. And he was you know, tasting it and saying, you know, do I detect pepper? Um, so as he said, context is key when it comes to art history uh, or the application of some kind of punishment. And sure enough, if it's the end of the office day, we're just here to think, you know, marketplace of ideas. We try neutral loaf. It's kind of funny. But then we wander off to our reception and so forth. It's interesting that the same piece of food you know, could be construed as sort of a light entertainment on the one hand, or, or a, a violation of you know, your, your constitutional rights on the other. That's uh, Nutriloaf before it is baked. 
and that's it afterwards. Uh, and that's it. That's my presentation. Thanks.